I'll continue talking about faults and uh, another thing which we call uh, Boudin's. And uh, my co-authors are uh, Marta Adamusek and Marcin Dabrowski from P2P. And there's various contributions from other people. Ray Fletcher, who's in the audience here, Stefan Schmalholz, and uh, Neil Manktelow. So his first name is actually Neil, but yeah. <laughs> so if you walk around on the surface of this uh, beautiful planet, then you find the uh, structures like this one here. So I don't need to explain that that's a fold. But in the, if you at the same location look onto the ground, then you'll find things like that. And um, if you go around the corner, then uh, not only do you find uh, Ray Fletcher, who despite being roughly twice as old as me, is always uh, twice as fast and uh, twice as high when we're in the field, looking at this structure from the side. And um, so it's, it, this is clearly an extensional structure where we had two extension events with uh, two distinct uh, um, principal extension directions. And uh, so the total structure, which I cannot show, is that if you would look in from the side, that's actually a fold. So that and this structure here, you find on the on the fold limb. So you have compression and extension at the same time, beautifully uh, outcropping here. Now the the name of this uh, second part of this talk is uh, boudinage. So the structure that I just showed is what we call chocolate tablet boudinage because of the resemblance to a chocolate tablet. But um, it really comes from the French word boudin, which is uh, the name for uh, blood, sausages. And uh, so it was originally meant more for structures like this, where you have a layer that has been clearly stretched and um, formed these very attenuated necks. So you only have these very thin strings between these uh, blobs. And I will talk about the, the real boudins and not the chocolate tablet boudinage. But it's also, I think it's mixing blood sausages and chocolate is not very nice. Um, historical note, we're apparently celebrating 50 years of uh, plate tectonics uh, this year. We can also go back uh, much, much further uh, in uh, time, in the past time. Regarding folding, you probably find the first, you know, halfway applicable analytical solution that was developed by Euler 250 years ago. And then uh, already in the early 1800s, Sir James Hall published uh, papers where he uh, devised salt and analog experiments and put them together with the observations that he made in the, in the Scottish uh, Highlands. And uh, if you it's, it's fantastic nowadays with the internet. We can find all sorts of uh, things that we don't want to find. But then occasionally you actually come across, for example, the archives of uh, Popular Science Monthly. And just to show what they already knew in, in, in the 1800s, this is the issue from 1875, where you find these beautiful drawings of the surface and, uh, and these cross sections across uh, the mountains and speculations of how it looks in the in the Earth's interior. Yeah? So it's not just you know in the last 20 years since we have seismic that we know what uh, is happening inside the Earth, but it really goes back a long time. In the same um, journal, uh, just uh, four years later, they published this uh, beautiful analog experiment. So this is a clay experiment which uh, they devised to uh, uh, explain uh, mountain folding and looking at this I, I mean I, I think in recent times I haven't seen anything that beautiful actually now at the time they had the wrong reason yeah but uh, it, it was actually I mean they knew it was somehow related to the cooling of the earth uh, and and what's happening but then they didn't know about mantle convection and the things that uh, you explained to us this morning they uh, related it to uh, shrinkage of the earth yeah so they got the reason for the driving force wrong but but the process of uh, folding, they certainly got right. Now, okay, so we know these things for 200 plus years, so why would I still talk about uh, uh, folds and pudins when the title of the Comsberg seminar is Earth System Challenges? So what is the challenge here? Well, I think that 
you know, people kind of left these uh, small scale features prematurely because, okay, faults are shortening, who does are extensional features, you know? But do we really know more about them? Well, not much. And that's a pity because on the outcrop scale, we can go and directly investigate what's, ha what's happening. You can actually, if you want to, you can cut a you know, sample out and you can take it home, analyze it under the microscope or put it into a deformation rig. You can determine the material properties on the various conditions. And um, so it's, it's, they're really good test cases to put together our understanding of, you know, how we can relate geometry and kinematics to mechanics and rheology. And it can serve as a test bed for uh, large-scale concepts where we don't have this possibility for uh, direct testing, if uh, how it works. So let's first look at faults. Well, it's kind of crazy. You know, in, in the third millennium, we have these big computers. We have these big, nice uh, computer models. We can actually generate 3D faults. We can uh, model this instability, no problem such as down here. But to quantify the geometry is actually quite quite a challenging task. Yeah? And you would think, say, well, why? You know, a fold is a simple thing. It's uh, confined by inflection points. Inflection points are the points where the curvature uh, changes its sign. Uh, for, on every fold, you have a point where you have a maximum curvature. That's what we call a hinge. So that should be simple enough. Yeah? Yet, there is no tool that uh, is available that actually does this type of analysis for you. And already with this definition, you see that there is actually a problem because it, so this relates to curvature of an interface. So it's quite easy to figure out, well, okay, here is probably the, the hinge, the point of maximum curvature. Um, you know, somewhere here is, is, are the inflection points. Huh? Now, faults, they have a non-zero thickness. So it's not just one interface, but two interfaces. And if I have something like this, then yes, I can identify these points in one interface, but not on the other one. So how are you going to link, link this tool? So given that there's no tools that do this type of analysis for you, you could try to rely on humans, yeah? such as me, just doing it before, you know, kind of like as an inflection point somewhere there. It's unfortunately not very accurate. And it's even worse because educated geologists, they're really bad interpret at interpreting faults. And I'll, we're not the first ones to notice that. It was published in 75 uh, by Chadwick, who uh, wrote this paper on the psychological analysis of uh, observation in geology. And it turns out, so here's these this little arrows or the actual inflection points. And he asked 22 social geologists to analyze this for, for him. And, you know, you see the spread. But there's not only a spread, there's also a systematic um, error. Because somehow, the, our focus is always on the antiforms. So systematically, these uh, social geologists would put the uh, inflection points too close to the, to the top, to the, too close to the antiforms. And uh, you can easily test that on yourself here. I have uh, two sets of folds from the left and the right, and they look very different, right? It's just this picture here is this one rotated by 180 degrees. You know? and it takes you a while to realize that. And it's exactly this human, you know, or, well, geologist focus on, on the antiforms. We look at the, at the fold as antiforms kind of linked by... Um, by uh, hinges in the in the thin forms, huh? it actually turns out that it's much better to ask uh, a paleontologist to interpret this for you, because they think of it as as worm tubes, yeah? so they look at it uh, in map view, and they don't have this bias towards the antiforms. Okay, so uh, here are the conclusions of this paper, basically saying that uh, geologists, um, what they perceive in rocks and remember of them is not necessarily what is actually there. And uh, even worse is they actually uh, remember things the way they think it should be rather than what it is. So the model, model driven. Yeah? I will try to... But, okay, so, so faults are kind of at the beginning of structural geology and it was always this aim that uh, you could do this relation 
uh, establish this relation between geometry and mechanics. So we set up and developed this tool, which we call the Fold Geometry Toolbox. And uh, Marta wrote a paper about it. It's in press now. You will be able to download this uh, tool from the MATLAB file exchange. Marta has a paper about it, and she also has a notebook. So if you want to play around with it and uh, test if you're biased towards uh, antiforms, you can uh, talk to Marta about it. What did we have to do to develop this tool? Well, there's a certain... Well, mo most previous tools would not be able to deal with uh, multi-valued uh, functions, for example. So if you, if you would rotate your fold train, all of a sudden things wouldn't work anymore. You can uh, overcome this. That's okay. Then um, you can calculate curvature and uh, plot it versus arc lengths. If you do that, then you end up where, you know, everybody says, well, that's just an academic problem. Yeah? Just go find the hinge. It's a point of maximum curvature. What's the problem? Well, this here is a very well-behaved fold. If I put this into a computer and analyze what the curvature is, I end up with many, many hinges and even more inflection points. So you need to filter this. So we do that by uh, applying a weighted moving average uh, filter. If you don't filter, then you have a lot of inflection points. If you filter too much, you have lost all of them. So you want to be somewhere in between here. So for this, so this, this tool basically only asks you one input, and that's you have to click on this plot here, which we call the NIP FW diagram. So that's the number of inflection points uh, plotted versus filter width. And you see that if you use a very broad filter, then you lose all the points. If you use a very narrow filter, then all the points are, uh, all the possible points are uh, flagged as uh, inflection points. But in between, you get this area where you have this uh, plateau here. And that's where the filter is uh, um, really capturing your faults. So if you click somewhere in there, then you will get a reasonable distribution of inflection and uh, hinge points. We have to do some more filtering. Don't talk about that now. If um, you then apply this to our... Uh, uh, this is fascinating. I have gray layers and everything, and here it's just points. Anyhow, so if you apply this to, um, to these natural folds, then you end up with a reasonable set of inflection and hinge points. So at least this is optimized now. But... In order to relate geometry to what we know from the mechanics of folding, we need to know other parameters as well, such as amplitude and wavelength. So, now if you open a textbook, then you will find many, many definitions of them. And most of them are simply not uh, robust. Yeah? You take a fold, rotate it, it won't work anymore. There's many other reasons why. You know, that they may depend on properties such as midlines or axial surface traces and so on that are simply not defined. So most of them we have to reject. Luckily, there's a few few that survive. We also need to know thickness. That's so that's where we really need to start to be able to link the the top and the bottom interface. You know, well, you can say, well, that's that's also quite easy. You just go along an interface and uh, you project all these rays orthogonally away from from the interface. Now it turns out it's completely different if you do that from the inner interface or from the outer interface. Or you can use dip isogons, but dip isogons, they depend on axial surfaces and those we don't know. So no, nothing really works for, for thickness. So what we do here is we solve the Laplacian on this uh, fold train. We set zero and one boundary conditions, no flux boundary conditions along the top of, on the bottom, and then we plot isocontours of this function. The nice thing is that that forces, so this near zero flux uh, boundary condition forces the isocontours to be orthogonal, locally orthogonal to the interface and it connects uh, uh, reasonable points on the top and bottom interface. So we, you know, so that, and, and it works for any kind of uh, fold shape. So that, that's quite neat. So that, that, that concludes the geometry part. But uh, now let's look at if we can actually relate geometry and mechanics. So um, the way to do that is we simply took a uh, finite element code and ran a synthetic um, fold, viscosity ratio 100, shortening 30%, put it into the fold geometry toolbox, it produces uh, this, uh, this diagram for you. You simply have to click somewhere in there, then you end up with a reasonable set of uh, engine inflection points. 
and um, we then get all the necessary arc lengths and wave lengths and amplitude parameters so I, that we can plot it into the uh, plug it into the various analytical solutions that are available. So this was a linear viscous uh, case. So if you go and you simply take uh, Biles formula um, for this, then it will give you a viscosity ratio of 56. So that's too too low. But that's actually well known because what Biles didn't take into account is that as you shorten the the layer and develop the folding instability, you also thicken it. So you need to take this into account, and that's what uh, Sherwin and Chapel did in 68. And if we do that, then we end up with 106 for the viscosity ratio for this system. So that's basically spot on. You can use others as well, such as uh, Sherwin and Fletcher or, or Schmaltz and Polachikov. If you plot it on that diagram, I'm sure you're not able to see that, but you get the viscosity uh, correct here plus also the amount of shortening. So this is 30% shortening, if you see this line here. So that works well. Now, unfortunately, that's only the proof that it works for synthetic cases. So what about nature? And in uh, recent years, there have been a number of papers where um, the researchers have decided that the effective viscosity ratios and the power law exponents that we need to develop these instabilities are too low. Now I find this, find this strange because in the previous talk we have seen just uh, the, what the anisotropy uh, would do for the diffusion creep. Well, you had, you know, four orders of magnitude difference in viscosities in your uh, perovskite there. Somehow, theoreticians and also people that actually measure real uh, rock properties have decided that it should be maximum 10 or less. The problem is then that uh, then social geology sort of uh, uh, doesn't work anymore because it's mechanics. And if I only have 10, that's like the bottom limit of where uh, mechanical instabilities work. So I would blame it on that there's actually no systematic natural data sets available, no systematic analog data sets available. Um, there's not too much uh, numerical data sets around either, and we have quite huge uncertainties uh, regarding effective uh, viscosity ratios. So now, with FGT, hopefully we can now develop uh, this data sets, and I'm going to show a little bit uh, numerical data sets. Now, effective viscosity ratios and power law exponents. So we have already seen this uh, in two talks now, in Johns and in Margins that uh, um, we're dealing with nonlinear viscous uh, fluids, where the relationship between stress and strain rate is not linear anymore, but the effective viscosity depends on the second invariant of the strain rate, so the intensity of, uh, of shearing. Now, now, that's a nice expression, but it really doesn't tell you anything. So that's why I brought the picture along. So. If I, if I run a multi-layer folding experiment where I have such a power law uh, fluid in the matrix and in the layer, then, and, and plot the viscosity, then you see the viscosity variations are quite uh, uh, pronounced here all over the domain. And, for example, in, in the layers that are folding, you see that the limbs be become stiff. So they're basically just stiff, they become stiff rods, and, and the deformation is localized in the hinges, where then you have this positive feedback and the mat material actually becomes softer. Now let's look at the number of um, mm, numerical examples where I vary the viscosity ratio, that's the first number here, power law exponent in the layer and power law exponent in the matrix. So these are individual uh, experiments, yeah? they're just plotted together. Uh, there was a question before about the regularity in, uh, if, once we have uh, power law viscous uh, layers. And uh, you see that so here I have a linear viscous case. I still get folding down to about the viscosity ratio of 20 to 1. In, uh, if I have power law with uh, power law 5 in the layer and the matrix, I can actually go down to 8. And if you look at this case here where I have 20, 
you can see that you know I would still call this quite a regular uh, folding. So I guess that that answers your question to the previous uh, speaker. So and so the, the viscosity ratios here that uh, I need to generate folds are quite reasonable. The power exponents are quite reasonable as well. Let's have a look at the uh, uh, natural cases. So I have here three three uh, layers that we analyzed. So first thing is uh, we determined the arc length to thickness ratio that ended up between 6 and 12. And um, when we convert this into uh, viscosity ratios, we get values from well, 14 to 78. And uh, for cases A and B, so that's a quartz layer in calcite and the calc silicate layer in the uh, uh, marble. Um, I can plot them on this diagram here where I've taken to so plot the effective viscosity ratio for uh, a number of material pairs as a function of temperature, assuming a constant strain rate. And uh, you see that at least I can plot these uh, viscosity ratios that we inferred on the corresponding uh, flow low uh, ratios. And what you also see is that quite a lot of them really plot above uh, 10. So I don't know where this statement comes. I mean, OK, you can make this statement because you can look at uh, cases like this one here, where we never have a viscosity ratio that's bigger than 10 to 1. But for many natural pairs, I would claim that you can go up to, to 1,000. Now, if we had independent uh, temperature control, we could verify if this location is correct here. If, you know, through having uh, bigger data sets, we could establish that this really works, then you could actually use this type of data as uh, a paleo thermometer, yeah? just knowing the, the flow laws. So that's a nice thing. There's uh, lots of open questions when it comes to uh, folding. For example, we don't really know very much about uh, folding instability when we have uh, massive multi-layer stacks. You go away from these nice sinusoidal shapes, you all of a sudden end up with uh, chevron type uh, folds. It's actually amazingly difficult to make asymmetric folds. We often see asymmetric folds in uh, nature. They're usually um, interpreted as uh, simple shear dominated folds. So here we have put the multi-layer stack into simple shear, and you can see that you know, we basically have a symmetric uh, uh, fold stack. Um, other questions? In, in Oslo, we're in this uh, fortunate situation that we actually have a fold and thrust belt that we can basically walk down to. Unfortunately, there the folding is not in, in real layers, but it's in uh, nodular limestones, and so we have various uh, packing densities from very dense to quite isolated to completely isolated uh, um, nodules. Still, they, they do fold. The, the question is, how does this work? Now, what are the effective material properties in this case? When does a nodule be, uh, decides to behave as an individual nodule? And when do many of them all of a sudden decide to be, behave as an effective uh, layer that has some, some uh, bending stiffness? So here, some experiments for that. If you have a packing fraction of 50%, uh, and you shorten this, not much is happening. If you increase the, the fraction, then all of a sudden, uh, is exactly this happening, that these this guys don't behave as individual inclusions anymore that try to avoid each other, but you get this uh, folding here. If you look at the details, you can see how probably the effective viscosity of this layer is increasing as we are shortening it because it's it's kind of ejecting the, the matrix material that's in between the inclusions away from from the actual uh, layer. And you can also see here um, that's basically a thrust in this, uh, in this uh, polyphase uh, material. But there's lots of open questions for folding. But what about Poudinage? This is a person, by the way, for for, for scale. This from um, these Boudins are in the Kalaknap, which is uh, up uh, in northern Norway, very close to the to the North Cape. Well, you can say, well, just 
just use your finite elements again and uh, plug in what we know how uh, rocks should behave. So that's what we have done here. So we vary the, the power law exponents in the layer and in the matrix. So here is the power law exponent 5 in the layer and 1 in the matrix. And we pull this and basically nothing happens. We have a sinusoidal perturbation and we were hoping to, to get this uh, necking instability. But we don't get it. Basically we have to go up to uh, power law exponents of 10 in the layer and in the matrix. And then you really start to, to develop this instability. If, uh, so th this was just one, trying to make one notch. If you look at an entire layer, which we randomly perturb and then uh, pull, then you see that basically all our experiments here fail. We need to, so, um, so the upper one is uh, power exponent 5 and viscosity ratio 100 between the layer and the matrix. So that, that's quite a lot. And if we would do the same for folding, then we would get very, very beautiful folds. But for Poudinage, it doesn't seem to work. We need to go down to this experiment here, where we have viscosity ratio 100 and the power law exponent of 10. And then we kind of get something that looks like uh, this picture from Northern Norway. The only problem is that this is, I have a lot of uh, vertical exaggeration in this plot. So if I zoom into this guy here, it's not this nice sausage with this string. It's more like this, you know, very, very elongated ring that just uh, wedges out to the sides. So, does this Buddha model work? Is it applicable to uh, nature? Well, okay. It, it does produce some sort of Buddha. The problem is that the N um, values are too high. The viscosity ratios are also high. The geometries uh, are not do not correspond to what we see in uh, nature. These high ends, they're not compatible with the fusion of this location creep because there I can only have a maximum uh, N of about uh, 5. You could try to attribute it to some kind of uh, failure mechanism. So for example, if you think of it as a from Mises material, then you can have N infinity there. But it's not always what we find in those necks. So I think what we should really look into in order to explain the natural Boudins is to have uh, strain-dependent material properties. Because we also know that once we neck, we thin these uh, layers and, and neck them out, we have a grain size reduction. We probably have a switch in the deformation mechanism. Fluids may come in and uh, weaken, weaken these uh, necks and uh, reactions may, may take place as well. And uh, we started to work on this, um, where we look at the, the strain effects of uh, uh, such polyphase materials that rocks always are. So this is a simple shear experiment where we start with a random um, distribution of this uh, of the constituents, and you see that after um, yeah, I think that's a strain gamma shear strain of uh, 10 or 20 or something like that. We have this strong um, orientation and elongation of the in this uh, rose diagram here. And that again leads then to changed material properties. But for me the main question is that well, you know, you start to wonder, well if you don't really understand how Boudin's form, does do we really know how faults form? Because faults basically form in the same material. And uh, maybe we also overlooked you know, the same kind of first order uh, parameters or processes in uh, uh, for the folding. Yeah? Not just because it works and it produces nice folds, it means that it's uh, really applicable to nature. Is this an academic question? Well, I think to some extent yes, but uh, you, know, you have seen in the previous talk when we tried to figure out what's uh, happening deep in, in, in the Earth's interior, we need to know the effective material properties and uh, how things evolve over uh, strain and develop anisotropy and so on. Thanks a lot. <laughs>